The Acadians were not the last and only group of French-speaking people to come to Louisiana. They were not the last. There was also the 19th century Saint-Domingue Creoles, black, white, uh, and of color, who arrived here um, before the Haitian Revolution. There was also the 19th century French, uh, many of which were Napoleonic soldiers who had settled in uh, central, well, in what we call southwestern Louisiana, where I come from. In fact, one of them, uh, the famous Louis Garrigue de Flojac, had been a general. He would become a very important uh, business person and civic leader in St. Landry Parish, at the, what was then known as the Post of the Opelousas in the Spanish period. He, along with two other uh, allies and former French soldiers, who had become very important leaders and figures and even open French-speaking uh, and French instruction schools to perpetuate the language, and this in the American period in the late uh, 19th century. The groups uh, such as the saint domingue Creoles, the saint domingue Creoles outnumbered the Acadians uh, in, a, in a big way. These people would bring the refinements to the city of New Orleans. They brought opera. They brought uh, craftsmen, artisans who created the beautiful furnishings we now call antiques. They were designer furnishings for the fabulous mansions of the American Garden District, um, as well as fabulous furnishings for French Quarter residents of wealth. That, uh, that material culture uh, is documented in a special encyclopedic volume that was produced um, with the historic New Orleans uh, collection and Dr. Jack uh, Holden and historian Brian Costello, uh, a very good friend of mine. So that culture is documented. The impact, including voodoo and jazz funerals, uh, is still felt in New Orleans, but some of that influence, the commercial end of it, the entrepreneurial spirit, would move into the country because of uh, business and familial contacts between New Orleans and, and the parishes that are now called Cajun parishes or Cajun country, which were always historically known as the French-speaking triangle and the Creole parishes, parishes before Cajunization relabeled everything after 1968 and in the early 1970s with Edwin Edwards when Acadiana, this mythic region of uh, 20 parishes or more, uh, 64 parishes, I think it is, uh, that was presumed to have been an Acadian settlement, uh, many of which had no Acadian residents at all, uh, and so forth. But these groups, these various groups, such as the Germans and the Irish, would contribute, and the saint Creoles contributed immensely, both to the, the, the material culture and the cuisine, in a way that the Acadians did not. For example, we know that Madame Begg was a 19th century German woman. She really stir, stirred things up at the uh, French market in what is now Two Jacques at the, at the, um, at the cafe, near the Café du Monde. Madame Begg improved Creole cooking. She was German, but she married two Frenchmen, and she whipped everything up into a, a famous cuisine that made New Orleans the place to go for those who were wealthy and traveling on the steamboat to have a meal that could last for several hours at her restaurant, which is now the uh, current location of Toujacs near the Café du Monde. The, uh, the Germans taught the Acadians how to play the accordion. They gave us potato salad with gumbo. Uh, they gave us beer making. They gave us sausage making. It's true to the Creole Métis, the French Indians already had smoked meat. That is well documented to the rural parishes where I come from. It was an Indian practice. The Choctaw were, uh, were cattle raisers. They smoked meat. But it was the Germans who turned it into the sausage that we all love. The Creole Picayune Creole Cookbook of 1902 mentions the beloved Creole uh, sausages, pork sausages that were heavily spiced uh, with cayenne that uh, our last French governor, Pierre Clément Lossat, had so, uh, so badly complained about when visiting the, the then Creole Cantorell family on River Road at their plantation home where the, the Choctaw showed up uh, and they all started speaking French and Choctaw, he said, which is really Louisiana French. But as long as the, the Choctaw cousins hadn't come 
come by the Homa. Uh, the Cantrell family continue to speak proper French with him. Uh, but it's true that even in our homes today in the country, we will blend the Choctaw expressions with uh, with the French, Louisiana French. It's how we speak Louisiana French. But the there were French uh, Flemish speaking families from La Hanot that were in Louisiana sh shortly before and after the founding of New Orleans. They added to our Creole diversity. The Italians and Sicilians contributed unique cultural traditions, long part of New Orleans and southern Louisiana's Creole heritage. They contributed things like the famous St. Joseph altars, the glorious funerary and religious sculpture and paintings of so many of the beautiful churches and cathedrals of New Orleans, our beloved macaroni and cheese, muffalettas, the oyster and artichoke soup, vermicelli soup, fig pies, garlic and gumbo anisette, uh, that licorice drink that was hidden in the uh, armoires for special occasions and marriages and so forth, and uh, served in the, the quaint little aperitif glasses that uh, we all so enjoy even till this day. Through the Catholic intermarriages with Creoles, these groups added to the diversity of the Creole culture, but they all carried along with them the foundation Creole Métis traditions, corn mock shoe, the use of tomatoes, sweet potatoes with gumbo, uh, and so many dishes that we take for granted. Uh, we forget the contribution of the Native Americans, or rather the Amerindians, indigenous peoples, the Muscogean family of Indians, uh, who are still very much alive across Louisiana and Mississippi. The Picayune Creole cookbook does mention the contribution of the Germans, the Irish, the Italians, as well as the uh, our Amerindian or First Nations peoples, and more recently, scholarship has realized how ignored and um, suppressed their contributions have been. And so, there are, there's scholarship today that ref that reveals that. In fact, um, I'm trying to remember one of the references uh, that give us that information. Um, bear with me for just a moment here. One of the uh, recent Jack Weatherford. Jack Weatherford is a Native American, is a scholar of Native American culture. In his new book, Indian Givers: How the Indians of the Americas Transformed the World, um, this 1998 work actually reevaluates the contributions of Native Americans in the cuisine and traditions, not only of Louisiana but across North America. Anything we, we cook using cornbread is of Native American origin. Uh, the Indians had rice, wild rice, Aquatica zizania and Aquatica texana, long before African rice was being imported. And this is verified by Charles Duprats, who wrote the earliest history of Louisiana, uh, the 1718 volume, when he was here in New Orleans. The fact is that the Mobilian Choctaw terms and so-called loan words reflect a very deep relationship and the cross-cultural and interracial marriages that were enjoyed uh, between the French and Muscogean family of Indians here in New Orleans. And not to be excluded is the hand of the, the African hand in the pot. When the West Africans came after the French and the Indians had already created a Métis Creole culture and cuisine, the West Africans were married into the family. Under Louis XIV, uh, the freeing of slaves was very simple in French Louisiana, and cohabitation, if not legal marriages, and often legal marriages, were the reality of the day. Under Louis XIV, that was acceptable, as in the earliest copies of the Côte Noir uh, produced uh, in, the, uh, in the French kingdom. Louisiana French reflects the métissage, or the marriage, of the uh, French and the Indians from the earliest times. So many of our words reflect that. Louisiana's, uh, Louisiana French's daughter language, Curivini, uh, it also reflects the same thing. It's the same lexicon from which they both draw. Uh, Curivini is not the same as Haitian French. It's a Louisiana-born form of French. But the fact is, is that the uh, indigenous Mobilian Choctaw terms invested in Louisiana French and Creole reference a far greater reservoir beyond just trade jargon or loan words 
those who foster such an opinion of trying to discount the influence um, in Louisiana French and of and our culture uh, really don't realize what they're talking about. It's either a lack of scholarship or disingenuousness that causes them to simply ignore this most profound fact and level of the earliest part of Louisiana's creolization. It is this formative period in Louisiana's metissage uh, period, her earliest French Indian cultural foundations, which has been so myopically discounted and disallowed into the conversation, explanation, foundation, and understanding of the development of Louisiana's Creole uh, culture. Known or unknown, this legacy is shared by all of its present day and ethnically diverse Creole people black, white, red, yellow, and brown. The profound imprint, even though unnoticed, uh, the unnoticed uh, influence of the Amerindians on Creole, American, European, and African foodways, as I said, is just being reevaluated. I often am called upon to speak about this because in my two books, Louisiana's Creole Food and People and Culture, I explore the origins of our ethnic diversity through the food and through the names of the food that uh, are beyond anything French. The French is there, obviously, but the food recipes and some of the names preserved in Louisiana French reveal both the African and the Native American and Spanish and uh, other sources of the hands, the many hands in the pot. The fact is, is that um, the relationship between the Native Americans and African originated peoples uh, would result in the greater diversity of the people here in the New World that produced that new identity and the new traditions that were different from those of our ancestors, black, white, red, or yellow. That concept of black or white did not exist in the French colonial period, uh, even as it doesn't exist in Europe, in the ways that the American-influenced mind would have us read it. It was very different. There was great interracial fluidity under Louis XIV. It, uh, even though after he died, the racial barriers began coming up, it was really in the American period that everyone had to become black or white, and interracial marriages were legally forbidden, even uh, cohabitation as such. Even though interracial marriages were forbidden at the, uh, after Louis XIV died, uh, it did not mean that if a slave was freed that they could not be married. And when they weren't married, the Catholic Church's representatives, out of concern for morality and the dignity of the people, uh, blessed the unions and made it acceptable uh, to the people. There were other groups of people, the Spanish, the Malagueños, the uh, Elenios, who would come also, and uh, the 19th century French, as well as the Haitians, all of them, along with the Acadians, reinforced the use of Louisiana's uh, homegrown or home-evolved form of French that reflected the different influences of these groups. For example, like Michaela Almonester, we use the Spanish legal terms and financial terms in Louisiana French. We don't say uh, un dollar for a dollar in Louisiana French, we say un piace, and so forth. There are many different uh, examples of that. But as noted above, the completion of this rich cultural embroidery was later adorned by with 19th century Italian and German uh, and Irish contributions. The Roman Catholic faith traditions, the old colonial French language, comprised a sort of a national identity in the Louisiana Territory. An undeclared Euro, Afro, Latin, Caribbean, and Creole Métis nation, an extension but cultural variant of the old French colonial world. 300 years of evolution in Louisiana, but if we consider as an extended but variant part of the international fabric of French Creole culture, then it's 500 years old. I often think of the words of the great Gabriel de Bien, citing a former Monsieur Picolet 
a former Saint-Domingue Creole of the 19th century, was writing to his friend Stanislav Wash in New Orleans on November 16th in 1804. He gave his reasons for choosing Louisiana as his home. He says, and I quote, In a word, everything here leads me to look at other counties to find other count, count, countries to find a more convenient place to live. I thought I saw in Louisiana the place that would offer the most advantage, advantages to a poor colonist forced to flee because, first of all, they, Louisianians, speak the same language. Moreover, one finds there the same habits as well as Frenchmen who know more or less who you are, either personally or by reputation, and who share more or less the same culture. That same language was the old colonial French of the Maritime, a hybrid of the very old forms of French as represented by the varieties of men who compromised the Maritime, including Languedoc, medieval French, classical French elements which would pick up calques of Spanish, Afro-Latin, Caribbean, and Amerindian jargon, which became Louisiana French and his daughter tongue of Louisiana Creole or Coudi Vini. In reality, Louisiana French is a composite of old French elements evolving and devolving over centuries into the uniquely modern expressions of the Parisians, Parisian school of French political, the Parisian school of French political literary idealism. Even as its sister languages of Canadian French, Missouri French, known as Papa, Louisiana French, and the Creole languages of the Maritime, evolved into their current forms from both internal and external cultural political influences, albeit without the political and literary support needed to provide the growth and flexibility of oral and written expressions typical of contemporary languages. And that's who we are. 